One of the big things that came about with modern gaming was the advent of standardization. The number of competing brands that were radically different slowly dropped away in the rampant race to be the de facto king of the mountain in terms of hardware. This is good for compatibility reasons, as you no longer have to run an extensive setup program for each game you want to play, but it does limit player choice. Very few people enjoy messing around with IRQ ports and the like, but all this additional setup reveals a world that many younger gamers have never experienced. Much like graphics, sound is subjective. I've done comparison videos in the past where I've waxed lyrical about sound fonts and external devices, only to have fans of early sound cards pop up and tell me they prefer the OPL2 or free renditions because they feel more authentic. So while every modern game these days ships with the best possible sound as standard, there's a distinct lack of choice in how the player wants to experience things. The music in most modern games is waveform based, generated internally by the game's files, or in rare cases by it reading external sound clips that it's bundled with. That wasn't the case with a lot of DOS games whose music was sent out as MIDI instructions for the computer to figure out and then pass through to the speakers. The benefit of this? How you interpret that notation is entirely up to you and the hardware of your choosing, offering a flexibility that's unparalleled. And because these composers had to do it for multiple devices, games would often ship with multiple soundtracks that changed depending on the detected hardware. A game that typifies this mentality is Dune 2 by Westwood. It had support for Sound Blaster, Adlib, MT32, Sound Canvas, Tandy and PC Speaker. So the music could go from this... ...to this. And while technically they were the same soundtrack by Frank Klopaki, they were very different. If we go even further back to the original Dune, listen to the ad-lib soundtrack. I'm Duncan Ida. The Duke asked me to supervise the production of Spice. Well, for the moment I haven't much to do. I hope that we'll be able to extract large quantities of Spice very soon. Then the MT-32 one. If you really want to know about the properties of Spice, ask your mother, Jessica. Here are our current stocks of Spice. Do remember that Spice is by far the most valuable substance in the whole universe. And that it can only be found here on Dune. Yeah, okay, Duncan, we get the idea. Not only are the instructions different, but the soundtrack itself appears to have been written with Roland's device in mind. Here's the same soundtrack on the Sega CD version of the I'm Duncan Idaho. The Duke asked me to supervise the production of Spice. No, Duncan, nobody wants to listen to you again. Lonnie, play the Sega CD soundtrack over the top. Duncan will stand there and be quiet. It's different again. So now you have multiple renditions of the same soundtrack to pick from, depending on the device, even system that you play the game on. Your adventures in the Arakeen Desert can sound any way you want them to, thanks to the flexibility of 90s soundtrack design. And now, thanks to the advent of sound fonts and firmware-based emulation like Munt, you can have DOS games sounding completely different than they ever did back in the day. The foresight of developers to include sound instructions in MIDI compatible games means that we can make the music sound like it came from unsupported devices or entirely different systems altogether. The developers of Dune even patched their game with more sound options to allow separate audio and music settings, permitting users to have multiple sound devices triggered by the game at once, a feature that became standard in DOS games going forward. 
and because media instructions are notation based, it allowed compositional shifting on the fly, often through insertion of additional musical score, at the same tempo or at an alternating tempo, in order to seamlessly transition between pieces depending on the situation, or picking a particular part of a score or a limited selection of instruments. As witnessed in the brilliant iMuse sound system, present in LucasArts games like Star Wars, X-Wing, Dark Forces, and Monkey Island, and a few others. I'm probably forgetting some of the more obvious ones. Because modern games deal with waveforms, most of them instead have fading. Some will try to do the LucasArts thing where the music plays a separate piece to link others together, or conclude the current piece so that another will play. But it doesn't always work. With MIDI, you had control of every instrument, all the time. With modern waveforms, everything has already been mixed. So unless you included stems of every piece, you're not going to have the same effect. LucasArts ditched their MIDI systems and went to Redbook Audio in the late 90s, and it became one of the biggest complaints from players of their games. Gone were the subtleties and nuances of note-based soundtracks, replaced with looping clips played through your CD-ROM drive, irrespective of context. Sure, a John Williams score being played in CD quality technically sounds better than anything even the high-end MIDI devices could come up with back then, but you're losing all the situational awareness and the player's ability to both react to music changes and cause them. Two egregious examples spring to mind that I love. Loom got an enhanced CD version with voice acting, and in doing so, they replaced the beautiful Tchaikovsky music with... Okay, I, I guess we had to click over there instead. Not much in terms of audio going on here. And while the beautiful, fantastic atmosphere persisted despite this, it wasn't the same as playing the original floppy version. The Lord of the Rings got an enhanced CD-ROM version that improved the game in almost every way, backporting the two Tars soundtrack in CD quality with a fantastic orchestral performance. You can listen to it courtesy of Zine Music. Unfortunately, there was both no situational awareness and added sound effects. The result? Frantic flight music when you're in the middle of a peaceful part of the Shire and happy bird song tweeting away when you're in the depths of Moria. And because the soundtrack to the enhanced version was backported from the sequel, when I played the floppy version of the game with MT32 emulation, I was presented with the Fellowship theme, an almost completely different piece of music composed for the original game that didn't carry over to the enhanced version, as well as incidental pieces that weren't there either. When I finally replay The Witcher 3 or the Mass Effect trilogy, I'm not going to find any new songs or improved configuration for the sound. It's going to be the same soundtrack as when I first played the games, because aside from fidelity, sound in gaming hasn't really improved that much since the late 90s. But when you decide to revisit a game from your past that exists in the DOS era, pay attention to those sound settings, because there may well just be a way to make it sound entirely different than you could possibly imagine.